Hi robots, so I often get asked, and bugged about, why do you barely upload? Wouldn't more videos be more beneficial? And yeah, well it likely would, I do have two explanations for y'all. First off, I only like to make videos on things I'm passionate about. I can't just talk about anything, I like to speak into a microphone to escape the crippling loneliness that surrounds my life and my passion for a medium seen mostly as a distraction for kids, making it hard to talk about with Suzzles. Or in a more positive light, I only talk about things that feel like a necessary task to do. Like the wild robot. Haha, <laughs> nailed it. Yeah. Now, listen. I don't typically talk about animated films for a few reasons. It's hard to rave about something that I don't have all the necessary footage of, and if I were to wait until it's on digital, it's no longer relevant. And to be honest, well... Yes, we've got in our spider voices and our Nomonas, there's still a lot of generic stuff coming out that's not worth my time. But this ain't no ordinary animated feature. The Wild Robot has been on my radar for a while. And by for a while, I mean for one year since it was announced. Chris Sandals is an animation legend of sorts, known for Lilo and Stitch, How to Train Your Dragon, and he wrote a bunch of the 90s Disney Renaissance films. Like, the man is Stitch. However, to be fair, some of his more recent work has received mixed responses, so it was fair to be a bit hesitant, even with the extra insurance for Dean de Blas producer credit. Then the trailer came out, and my brain broke. Oh my god. Oh my god. The emotional music, the beautiful animation all completely without dialogue? This looked amazing. So amazing, in fact, that I watched it on repeat for a few days there. I never read the book, and I still haven't bothered, so it was really easy to overanalyze everything on display here. But of course, like most movie trailers, it left public consciousness about a week after it came out, but DreamWorks made sure it hadn't left mine. Since that moment, it felt like Universal was spending half their marketing budget specifically targeting me. I couldn't escape this movie since around June. I'd always see how the crew was at Annecy, or Comic Con, or Toronto Film Festival, and every new trailer and promo got recommended to me the second it came out, and all things considered, it worked. I was overexcited for the silly robot movie. It got so bad that after seeing a promo featuring the Billy Ayer song, Boards of a Fezzle, I started listening to it. And it became one of my most streamed songs this year. Just because I associated it with this movie I hadn't yet seen. So despite my dramatic tone, I think it's pretty obvious that going into this movie with all the promotion and all the stellar reviews and the fact that I follow DreamWorks on Twitter where they have retweeted every single post about this movie except mine, I was pretty hyped. And was it worth it? Well, I think it's only fair to say DreamWorks is back, baby, only 12 months until they're dead again, as poor tradition, but still! The wild robot slaps, man, but also permanently broke me, so I'm excited to explain how. I'm going to try and keep things spoiler-free as they can be here, but there's a lot to talk about, so don't be surprised if I mention a few important details, just in a very vague tone. Basically, the wild robot follows Rosam Unit 7134, aka Roz for short, a robot who after getting shipwrecked in nature must interact with the animals, raise a gosling named Brightbill, and eventually make his way back to where it came from. It's a simple premise. Sort of. The story is simple on paper, but the way these interconnecting plot lines interact and support each other is fascinating to see. It's all because of the film's tight script, man. Some 90 minute movies like this typically struggle cramming everything into its plot. I know this is one of my biggest issues with Mario last year, however Wild Robot doesn't have any issues like that. The film just starts. No explanation for how Roz got there, no explanation the world were dropped into, just this is a robot, she's assigned to help people and can adapt to her environment. Go. We do receive some drops of that lore throughout, but it comes during crucial plot moments and only when the audience and the characters really need to know. The rest keeps moving from set piece to set piece, we have no detail feels unimportant. Obviously they do the classic, all the on gag becomes important in the climax moment, but the one that really stood out to me, and this may be a bit of a more spoilery detail, is how Roz got a hold of White Bill's egg. At first it's mostly brushed off, who cares, now the story is essential. However, a while later it becomes sort of a gag, which was surprising on its own, but later it becomes a crucial plot point within these characters' arcs, which is such a genius move, not only adding fools of drama, but also using its runtime to the fullest. Now, of course, this is a DreamWorks movie, so it's still a comedy. However, rather than being crude or entirely childish, its comedy here is sort of dark. Lots of death jokes here and there, and there's nothing funnier than characters experiencing pain. 
a more loose style, and this would almost feel like a Looney Tunes film. If it wasn't for the fact it tore my heart into a million pieces. This film is emotional. I knew it from the reviews and the amount of ads that started with How to Train Your Dragon and Puss in Boots Last Wish clips, but man, it still got me as much as I could have been gotten when it's in a seedle. Like I said, on paper the central plot is simple, but the scenes here are not. The questions that brings out about nature and evolution are excellent. I love how it isn't just Roz adapting to nature or the animals adapting to whole, it's both sides of the spectrum, and the animals learning to evolve their interactions with each other as well. Though so one of the only negative reviews on Rotten Tomatoes thinks this is stupid, so if you agree with that, this film may not be for you. However, what I think is a real emotional core here is the character relationships. I just noticed there was background noise throughout the last 5 minutes, but in real time that would be 30 minutes to fix, so I ain't doing that, you can just ignore it. Roz here is the obvious stall and goes for the most profound journey. Her role as a helper robot means she's very kind, always helping others even when it puts her in pain, which a lot of the other characters take as being naive. Which, yeah, there's a lot of things here she doesn't know, and if you know this genre of sad animated robot movies, you know the journey here will have her get in touch with her humanity by the end. But I appreciate how, in this case, it doesn't feel like an entirely new character by the ending, just an evolved version of who we start with. I think the best representation of this is shockingly done by Lupita Youngo's performance here. The way her voice starts so robotic but suddenly becomes more lifelike is genius and it happens so gradually I didn't even fully notice until the process was over. It's a surprisingly well thought out performance for a studio like this. I'm used to Chris Pratt putting on a subtle Brooklyn accent or Chris Pratt talking like he's Chris Pratt, so this is a nice change of pace. This pairs very well with the journey of Bright Bill, portrayed by Kit Connell. Like I mentioned earlier, he's the goose who Roz finds herself raising, which means he's sort of naughty and an outcast, which becomes a source of conflict within himself and also with Roz. He's the character who has the most gross outside of her, and I give this British boy credit. His American accent is surprisingly believable enough to carry these moments. These two's relationship is the most emotional scene plot-wise. Scenes involving these two will likely be the ones to make you cry, but it doesn't mean they're the only ones who goes to Alks because we got Pedro Pascal as Fink the Fox, aka the most employed man ever. He has had three films this year, and he still has one to go. Whoever this dude's agent is, is never getting fired. He's more of a comedic relief role here, but he's perfectly cast in this role, starting off very sly and manipulative, but helping evolve Roz as he goes through his own gross. And everyone else here? doesn't have much to do, but though he's a fun, I'll have a memorable moment here and there. Now back to things that make me emotional, the soundtrack. DreamWorks has had a lot of memorable soundtracks over the years. The mesmerizing theme attached to Shrek and the funny license songs, the soaring tracks of How to Train Your Dragon, and the one sung song, and while I think it's too early to say if it lives up to those legacies, I think it's safe to say that this is great too, and does an amazing job carrying the emotions throughout. Even the two vocal tracks here, Kiss the Sky and Even When I'm Not, work perfectly within the story. The fourth even feeling like this film's test flight moment, though that could be helped by the additional compositions Chris Bowles did for the sequence. Which, by the way, anyone else shocked to look up the composal here and see Space Jam, Secret Invasion, and Bridgerton in his discography? Like, not to judge this man's agent, but he goes way too hard on the wrong projects. This man should be out here winning Oscars, not... Bridgerton schools. And not to shock any of you, but the animated movie with the unique old style looks great. Yeah, this film is gorgeous. It looks like a living painting and is so beautiful in fact that multiple shots here feel like they're just there because they wanted to brag how good it looks. That's not to mention how many shots here were also used as posters with barely any touch-ups. That's how good this film looks. Though it looks all bittersweet, especially considering how DreamWorks is going to start outsourcing animation for all their future features. Hey, at least they went out on a high note. But to really describe how good I think this movie is, I'm going to explain something really goofy. My brain can't handle it. Ever since seeing it a few days ago, I cannot stop thinking about the wild robot. I've been replaying different scenes and moments in my head on repeat. I've been thinking about his themes and how the film explores them, I've been listening to the soundtrack and just imagining the imagery and lines that go along with it and just getting emotional, I've been thinking about how it begun, how it ends, and I really, really am desperate to see it again immediately, and I can't? It's not on streaming or Blu-ray yet, so the only option would be going back to the Cedo again, and I don't know what the ticket guys would say if I wanted to see the wild robot twice. So then there's also content involving this I can consume, right? Well, there is the book, but I already wasted my one novel I read a year on the book of Bill. So that leaves a U2 splush, but come on, I don't have sooty dolls to 
Well, I guess I have to wait till February now. But still, no matter what I do, I cannot resist the urge to see more of this. More of this film that ended. And even if it gets a sequel, we'll have to wait years to see it. No joke, I have not been this obsessed with something since... Well, you already know. But since I'm having a hard time articulating it, let me just say. This film is special. It really is. It may be hard to describe without going scene by scene or yapping for another hour, but... I think this is a perfect movie. No hesitation, no joke, this is practically flawless. This is a film that felt so good to get right about now. I always love to get something that is such a comforting, heartfelt, emotional piece of art in a time like this. Please see it if you haven't, and especially if you personally know me, because I need to feel justified in my passion about this. Anyways, Chris Sandals, I love you and I hope you make the other two novels into movies because I am hoping this is doing well enough to justify a sequel because otherwise I will go insane. Anyways, what a great film, and a great end to Robot September. Oh, you didn't know that was a thing? That's where you're all wrong. Astrobot proved PlayStation could still create magic. Transformers proved his franchise could still be well received at all. And the Wild Robot showed that even in a studio environment, real art can be made. Great months for bot fans who love good products that do well. Um, except, um, sorry Transformers gang.